Let's stand together, church, and open our Bibles to Romans chapter 7 in our responsive or our congregational reading together. Uh, Romans chapter 7, I'll begin in verse 7. If you read the even-numbered verses, I'll read the odd-numbered verses. You guys know what to do. Romans 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Or perish the thought. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desires. For apart from the law, sin was I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. We're looking at a message titled, and we're in part two of it, Just When You Thought It Was Over. Just When You Thought It Was Over, uh, that, that statement, that title is often in the in the um, category or column of not good. Uh, but as believers, and if you read the Bible, I, I want you to grab this, by the way. I, I'm, of course, I'm going to ask you to remember every word that is spoken today, that's from God. Forget about the words I speak. But when God's word is spoken, grab it. But I got to tell you that for the believer, when we look at a title like this, just when you thought it was over, Instead of there being a dark cloud over your head, so to speak, raining on your parade, as a believer, or maybe you're here today or you're watching right now and you're not a true follower of Jesus, that whatever's going on in your life, you begin to wake up and realize, wait a minute, I thought, just when I thought it was over, it turns out that God's got a brand new life for me. Or like Paul, who we'll learn about more in this study, that in his religiosity, in his pre-Christ days, he thought that he had achieved everything. And in, in his argument this way, he could have said it just when I thought it was over where I completed all of the requirements. Check that box. I did that. I gave this much. Check that box. Check that one. And I did this mission or I did this adventure or I, I said this or I led so many people, right, to know God and I got these notches in my belt. Just when I thought it was over where I achieved all of my religious performance, oh, look at me, Paul was taken out at the knees by the Holy Spirit. Very quickly, church, we saw last week opening up just when we thought it was over, verse 7, that truth shakes you at the core. That's what truth does. It will shake you every time at the core of your very life. And we saw three key elements about how truth does that in verse 7. Number one, truth is factual. I was going to say truth is always factual, but that's, that's unnecessary, isn't it? That's redundant. Uh, you, you, you would be corrected by a grammarist if you said it that way. No, it's, it's simply this. Truth is factual. And we talked about that last time. Nobody's allowed to make up their own truth in the real world. If you live in the real world, you don't have your truth and they have their truth. And that is part of, that is the insane thinking of what is known as humanism. Uh, a world whereby you deify yourself. You would never admit this, but you've deified yourself to the position where you decide what's best for you. And even if that is at the expense of others, oh well, it's best for me. And it's the survival of the fittest. It's he who dies with the most toys wins, right? It's look out for number one. All those dumb bumper stickers that were around in the 70s, uh, that spirit is still working today. No, truth is factual. And then we saw last time that truth is surgical. We saw that God's truth goes in. Remember, we looked at 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, an awesome verse where God's word, when you quote it as a believer, look, you and I could be absolutely powerless, and we are as human beings, but when we quote the Bible, that's where the power comes from, and you can say truth And someone is going to be struck by the truth to the core, and that's a very surgical strike. And do you remember I showed you some of the clips where uh, the world is against uh, Christianity, that it should be now outlawed? We saw some of those clips uh, from the Finnish government or from the UK where biblical teaching and preaching should be outlawed because it causes people to feel bad, translation, If somebody feels bad where there's biblical preaching and teaching taking place, it's the work of the Holy Spirit using the word of God to surgically dig inside your heart, lay you wide open, and you have the sensation of, I've got nowhere to hide. You could be in a room of thousands of people and you feel like you're the only one there. Busted. And then we saw that truth is revealing. It's revealing. Mark Twain said, a lie goes around the world twice before the truth ever gets its shoes on. But you know what? Eventually, all lies come to nothing. All all lies not only are eventually exposed in time, Jesus promised that they will be known in the day of judgment. Nope, the truth is revealing. Very, very powerful uh, reality. And so in that... uh, last or third argument, church, we looked at this. How is it revealing? We didn't finish this off. How is this revealing to us? He says, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, and now he quotes, you shall not covet, which is a very amazing, everybody you read regarding, why did Paul go to that one? There's 10 of them. Because Paul is leading us into the depths of his own soul. Um, I hope that this is true for all of you. I, I, I know that it is true as time goes on. And that is the closer you get to Jesus, the less you see of yourself. The closer you get to Jesus, the less protective you are of yourself. Does that make some sense? The more you get to Jesus, the more that you become invisible. He increases as you decrease. And you can allow yourself as the great apostle to become very, very, what's the word? Transparent. And when he says to us, not the sixth commandment, not the third commandment, not the first, and not the eighth, he goes to the tenth. He goes to the last commandment, which is a very awesome thing because the first commandment exhorts us to love God with all of our very being. And then if you look at the last commandment, number 10, you shall not covet. Those two Laws of the Ten Commandments, the first and tenth commandment, hold as it were all of the other ones together. The first and the tenth are extremely similar because you can't worship God, right, if you covet. Why? Because you want something for you. And so if you want it for you, you will do everything you can to obtain that thing that you've got to have. That's why I said, some of those old sayings that are still alive today, look out for number one. The reason why that resonates with people is because people, we all are prone to covet. Do you know that? Don't be so quiet right now. (laughs) It's true. It doesn't matter what it is you say, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm a very simple person. There's something in your life where you look over the fence, so to speak, and you go, I want I want one of those, and I want one bigger. (laughs) Have you noticed that? I want one shinier. There's that thing within us. And um, you know the old saying, keeping up with the Joneses? Do you remember what that means? Young people will not know what I'm talking about, but young people, it goes like this. If somebody gets a really, really cool iPad or something, and you don't have it, That's keeping up with the Joneses. You you start scheming about how you can get an iPad just like that or whatever is the new phone. And you be, the one that you have is perfectly fine and it, it serves you and God has seen to it that be it whatever it might be, it serves you fine until you see something else. 
Have you noticed these Christmas commercials on TV right now? Did you notice how junky your car is now? All of us, all of us drive junks, you know. And if we're really going to send a message that we've arrived, we need to get that new Lexus. And we want it in the driveway with a bow on it. Where does that come from? We covet. The Bible tells us, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You can put in husband. Nor his male servant or his female servant. Nor his ox. That could be a F-150 Ford trimmer. Could be a Tesla, maybe. I don't know. Or his donkey. Donkey would definitely be the sports car of it. Or anything, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Why? Because if we have that covet nature allowed to survive, and we have to kill it, by the way, Christians daily. Do you all know that? You say, Pastor, we've arrived. You have arrived nowhere, nothing, no way. You may have gotten more Bible knowledge and you're closer to Jesus as a disciple, but just understand this. You and I have to fight sin constantly. You didn't arrive. You may have shown up and you'll leave later. That's about it. You did not arrive to some spiritual level where by, no, I, con I conquered that in my life. Every Christian, listen, this is, there's hope in this. There's, there's a, it, listen, there's some encouragement here. Every Christian, every day, must fight the basic animal passion desires that we had before we were a Christian. The difference is, before they used to hook us and lead us around, and then listen, in the world, we wound up t taking the hook out and just running toward those things. Now as a Christian, it's like, get back from me, get away, and you got sh shield up and sword out. And this is so cool because the law was written in stone and the law would say, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. The New Testament is this, thou gets to. Thou gets to do this, thou gets to do that, meaning the spirit of God works in you and now thou gets to be free. And the, what, what used to kill us in condemnation and defeat God wrote the law in our hearts to where we are excited about fighting the temptation when it comes. Listen, this is not a sales pitch. I honestly mean this. It's not, I, I, listen, I, God's my witness. That little booklet that was written recently, I even hate to put my name to it because it's all about Luke. It's from Luke's gospel regarding a brief portion of scripture where Jesus Christ teaches us how to deal with temptation when Satan comes attacking. And uh, if you don't get the book, you ought to get the audio version that's available wherever. And, and close your eyes and listen to it read to you. And you're going to go like this. Yep. Wow. That's right. Jesus did that. And he's telling me to do this. That's right. When Satan came and offered him food when he was starving, if Jesus would have been coveting, he would have fell for Satan's ploy. Instead, he rebukes Satan, who's using the word of God, by the way, wrongly. Jesus counters using the word of God rightly. And that's how we, are, as believers, are commanded to be able to use the word of God or to employ it properly. And that, that little book goes through that. How do we do that? By the spirit of God that now lives in us, the law is holy, just, and good. I'm not. But I find within myself, as you do, this great battle being a believer. That now I'm warring against these things of darkness and of evil. Philippians 3 verse 4 says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, Paul says, If anyone else thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I more so... This is, this is his BC days, his before Christ days. Circumcised the eighth day, every Jew would go, wow. Of the stock of Israel, wow, you're amazing, Paul. Of the tribe of Benjamin, really? I'm not. Well, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. 
That's Paul speaking before he met Christ. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Everybody was, ooh. Concerning zeal, I was so passionate, Paul would say, about following God and dedicating my every effort to God that I persecuted the church concerning the righteous, the righteousness which is in the law, he said of himself, I was blameless. Would you even dare say such a thing? You know what? You wouldn't dare such, say such a thing as a Christian, but do you remember when you were not a Christian? You may not have said it that way, but you believed it that way. And then God took us out. He convicted us. He showed us something completely different. You see, Jack, I don't know. I don't know about that. But think about this. If I mention right now something insane, something crazy, if I just give you, a, if I say something, uh, advertisement, a, a, a funny picture, a mind, a word picture, an image, in your head I say with words, Hey, whatever you guys do, make sure you don't. And I say it. Say, I don't want to say it because then, it, then I'll lose you. Because it would prove the exact point. So, yes, it's stormy, rainy, cold outside. But whatever you guys do today, don't take a drive along the beach. And now you're thinking, hey, honey, that's a great idea. Why, why stay indoors all day? We can drive along the beach. The crashing waves, the violent ocean against the shore, that's awesome sound. Let's go! You weren't even thinking that until I said it. The moment you, that's why advertising, especially at this time of the year, is so powerful. Boom, put the little thought right there. You weren't even thinking about that thing, honey. I think we need a, a new furnace. <laughs> Honey, we just bought one last year. Yeah, but I think we need a new one. Crazy things come out of us. When it gets in there, especially when we are forbidden. Yeah. No, thou shalt not. What? Tell me what I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> right? That's our nature. Come on. Come on. If you're not a, if you're not a Christian, you got to... Give up, come on, give up. You know what's true? You can be an atheist, I'm telling you right now. What I'm telling you is true. The moment you hear, you're not supposed to go over there. Yeah, you're already making plans. You prove God's word is a fact and that it's true and that it's cutting and that it reveals and that it exposes us right down to the very core. Listen to this. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, listen up, my Jewish friends, if the Ten Commandments could have given you life, meaning eternal life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Say amen, everybody. If you could get to heaven by keeping the rules, then let's go for it. Wow. But the scripture has confirmed all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to us who believe. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept, listen, under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would be afterward revealed. Therefore, the law was our, you might want to write this word down or remember it. It's an awesome word. The word in Greek is pedagogus. It's a big word, but it's awesome. Pedagogus. See, what's a pedagogus? In a wealthy home, you would hire a pedagogus to be in your house, highly educated individual that you paid. They were your private instructor to your children. We would call them a schoolmaster. That's the, that's the best we could do in our culture today is a schoolmaster. That you have in home a personal schoolmaster who is devoted to teaching your kid so that at a certain age they got it, right? The ultimate homeschool experience. 
where you bring only experts in on these things that you want your kid to know. It's not a classroom, it's one-on-one, journeyman to apprentice, as it were. And the word pedagogus is a word that means the schoolmaster keeps the rules. See, Junior doesn't want to keep the rules. Kids want to bounce off the walls. And the schoolmaster smacked them. Did you, get, you ever get smacked in school? Yeah. Mr. Anderson used to whack our knuckles with a wooden ruler. He'd make us put our hand on the table. He would hold the ruler and go like that. That was, listen, that's when we'd learn stuff in those days. They applied the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. And uh, the schoolmaster would do that. And he, he, would, he would make sure that kid gets it. And the Bible is saying that the law is the schoolmaster. And the law is saying you got to get it, you got to get it, you got to get it. But what if you don't get it? The schoolmaster doesn't care if you get it or not. He's going to stay at it until you either get it or you give up. Well, the law is perfect. You'll never get it. You may understand that it's holy and lofty and pure, but the truth is you'll never measure up. Enter Jesus Christ. (laughs) Number two, let's write this down. Number two in our study today is that reality strikes you at the heart. Verses eight through 10, and it does so as reality awakens you to yourself. But sin, verse eight, says taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me All manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. That one verse has got more genius in it than most books. So look at this on the screen. But sin, which is, listen, sin. Sin's an interesting thing. We know the definition of sin, but we don't know the origins of sin exactly. It's a very interesting thing. Theologians write volumes of books on this. It's impossible for us to know the exact answer, but we generally know this. Sin was brought or made uh, available to Adam and Eve uh, via the temptation, right? The temptation came, but listen, the temptation came from Satan to Eve, but it wouldn't have worked, it would not have worked unless God would have first said, don't eat from that, from that tree, listen. Listen. The origins of sin, we know that Satan sinned when he fell from heaven because of pride. It's a very complicated, impossible situation to answer regarding how did sin come into being. We know this, that sin, though we do not know how it came into being, we do know a few things. In the world that, are you listening? In the world that God created, both material and spiritual, regarding the entities, or can I say the word personalities, that reside within those two realms, angelic creatures and us, physical creatures, that wherever there are these characteristics of having a will, having a, an, a will to decide on your own, which all of, us, all of us approve of. We all like that. God built angel and human alike in this area. We can choose. And when we choose against God, it's because of coveting. We break away from God because we're coveting something else or someone else. Eve broke away from God because Satan came and said, hey, don't you want to be like God? Isn't it interesting, church? What was Satan's sin in eternity, the Bible tells us? Exactly. He wanted to be like God. Read Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. He said, I want to be like God. I want to sit on my throne above God. And Eve thought the same thing. You know what, after listening to Lucifer talking to me or this snake talking to me, seems to me that God's been holding out on us, Adam. Because I just heard a moment ago 
that I need to get this new thing. I just heard the commercial that that snake was telling me about. And this is what, uh, this is what we need. Eat the fruit. And that is an amazing reality. And in that moment, we are awakened to the fact that the reality is that we are the problem. Verse 8, sin taking opportunity. It's a remarkable statement. By the commandment. You say, Jack, wait a minute. Are you saying then that the law is bad? Because if I'm following you right, the commandment cannot be good because it was the commandment that gave sin the opportunity to cause me to wake up to the reality that I'm a sinner. No, you got that absolutely upside down. It's the commandment that exposes what none of us want to talk about if we don't know Jesus. Listen up, everybody, because that could be you in this room today. You are trying to approach God on a very, very uh, moral basis, religiously. And you start thinking demonic thoughts. You want to hear about a demonic thought? You start thinking a demonic thought like this. I'm not as bad as most people. You want to hear a really satanic thought? I'm a pretty good person. That's demonic. You ever think of that? I don't need Jesus like you guys do. You're sick. You're sin sick. It's remarkable. The commandment wakes us up to the realization, oh my goodness, where did that come from? We have sin that dwells within us. We have a sin nature. It's remarkable. Hmm. I wrote this note, of course. Um, we have an enemy within, uh, you and I do, and the enemy is sin or more exact a sin nature, that is that within every single one of us is a longing to do what pleases ourselves most. People will counter, because we hear it all the time in biblical guidance and counseling meetings is, but pastor, doesn't God want me happy? You ever heard that before? Doing this makes me happy. Doesn't God want me happy? Show, show me a Bible verse, find it, give it to me. No, you're gonna, here's where you'll find it. Jack 1-1. One, one. <laughs> I want to be happy. But you see what I'm doing? I'm coveting. I'm putting my, my pleasure seeking and I'm wrapping it with a religious bow and I'm making it into some form of, 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 of a religion that slides in and fits in under the banner of Christianity and you have deceived yourself and you, like the Galatians, have fallen for a false gospel. Paul said to the Galatians, someone's bewitched you. And there's, it's going on today. You can look it up later, not now. There's a lot of comments about you don't really have to be born again. Theologians are now debating this. Church, should it even be debated? Jesus said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. If you don't know what that means, it means this. You must be born of the Spirit of God which comes from above to enter the kingdom of heaven. And there's theologians talking about, well, really? Excuse me, but that's very, very reminiscent of snake talk. Hath God said? Hath God said? Reality strikes you at the heart. It awakens you to yourself. Secondly, the reality illuminates you and I to our condition. Verse 9 says, I was alive once without the law. What an awesome statement. Now listen, this is kind of great. You might, might want to write this down. Number one, up front, scholars believe this about Romans 7, 9. I was alive once without the law. Stop right there. There's a comma. They will tell you, and it's true, I get it, but I think it's bigger than this. They will say... At the age of 12, in Judaism, that's when you become a son of the law. Under that age, you have been nurtured and coddled and you've been taken care of, but then now, at the age of 12, that's why, do you remember at the age of 12? Remember, 
regarding Jesus. At the age of 12, his parents were looking for him. Do you remember? Where did they find him? In the temple. And every, all, all these scholars were standing around him listening. And Jesus is teaching them truth. <laughs> 12. They believed that at the age of 12, you, you now are a son of the law. So what does that mean? That now there's other portions of scripture now open to the apostle, or excuse me, open to Saul as 12 years of age to now study. You see? Now you're this age, we say you read these books. Now you get that. We do this with school. You're at this age now, you read these books. Okay? Best school of all, by the way, is to give them all the books up front early on. Don't get, don't, don't get sucked into this class category where your kid has got to study fifth grade math. Listen, many of our friends in Europe, their kids are brilliant. You want to know why? And they're all, they are don't say, well, my kid's not brilliant. They're all the same. Here's the deal. When they're fifth graders, they're doing ninth grade math. You want to know why? Because they've been exposed to ninth grade math when they were a third grader. They catch up to it. Set the bar and you'll get to it. Don't put the bar here. You just walk over it and learn nothing. They're saying this. Now, Saul, you've achieved all of these things. You've hit the age of 12. It's a, it's a rite of passage now. You are now a son of the law. And Saul is going, yay, thanks, Mom and Dad. This is awesome. And they go through a whole beautiful ceremony like a bar mitzvah or ba mitzvah for the female. And then they hand him the law. And this is what scholars believe, that at around the age of 12, Paul reads the 10th commandment. You shall not covet. And he was struck with reality to the core, to the heart. And from 12 to whatever age he was when he got converted, listen, it's going to sound like your life, my life struggled with knowing what's right, but always winding up doing what's wrong. And loving it. But you had this battle. I shouldn't have done that. But I'll do it again next week. We can all agree with that. We can all experience that. No, see, the reality illuminates you and I to the condition. I was alive once without the law, but then somebody showed me the law at the age of 12. And when the commandment came, that is when I got it, when I heard it, when I was able to understand that, we could say today in our Western culture, maybe, when uh, your kid came to the age of accountability, in many ways there's a correlation here. When the commandment came, the word came refers to understanding it. I, I got it. Well, what am I going to do about this? I, I, we've talked many times before about teen rebellion. Do you have a teenager? Um, best thing about a teenager is when they get out of being teens. Um, again, Mark Twain. I don't know why I keep thinking about Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, if you have a teenager, put them in, uh, when, when, they, when they reach uh, uh, 13, uh, put them inside of a 55-gallon barrel a oak barrel and feed them through a hole. And then he said, when they reach 21, just seal up the hole. <laughs> That's brilliant parental, parental counseling there on that. Alive once without the law, now what happens? Uh, but when the commandment came, I understood it. I understood it. This is so beautiful. Sin revived and I died. As a Christian, as you read the Bible, listen, you know what's so beautiful about this? As we read the Bible, can I just put it this way? When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When I read the Bible, when I see James tells me to make sure that I do what I can to make sure that the widows and the orphans are taken care of. He said, if you don't do that, you do not have a true Christian religion. And it's like, oh, holy, when was the last time I talked to a widow? Or I went, when was the last time I went to a, a place where kids have no parents or whatever? What, in this culture, I haven't even thought about finding out how I could be involved with the church or some other entity by which I could bless a foster kid for a day? Is there anything like that in existence? So you read, when the commandment comes, you awake 
to the realization, wow. Now as Christians, we don't go, oh my gosh, I'm going to hell. You don't do that. That's been settled for us. When the more we get from the word of God, the more our feet are busy about our father's business. And being busy about that business doesn't cause us to say, hey, I'm good, I'm going to go to heaven. Did you see what I just did with that kid? I just bought them a donut and a tricycle. Look at that. You don't do that. Because why? Because the commandment. Now he's talking about the law, but I'm talking about the commandment of us doing love, right? Think of it. Seeing someone in need or whatever the situation might be and responding. But when he says, I was, I was alive once, it means I'm doing great until the information comes. And I do believe personally, this is my take, I think that's why people avoid the Bible at all costs, especially when they don't want, they don't want to look at one. Because they, don't, they know down inside somehow, if I touch that book, some of it could get in me. <laughs> and it's a fact, church, that no pastor wants to. In fact, is this on the screen, you guys? Um, I think it's on page six of my notes. No pastor, here you go. So no pastor would want to admit what I'm about to say but unless you understand the purpose and the function of the law of God, there is no possible way for you to understand the purpose and function of salvation. Listen. The cross of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb. There is no possible way for you to be saved by having your sins forgiven unless you understand the law. It is a pastor's job to make sure that the congregation under his teaching knows that without faith, Jesus Christ, without faith in Jesus Christ, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of heaven. Think about that for a moment. I was going to give you a different quote from a Puritan, and his quote, his, basically it was this, that every pastor of a church should cause hearts to be troubled when he preaches the law so that the troubled heart will run to the cross and cling to it for protection. That's what we're supposed to do. Boy, is that a lost art today, right? It's amazing. So, well, I'm pretty good, best, I'm doing fine. Well, when he says that the, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, how about this? Galatians chapter five, verse 16. Galatians 5.16 says this. This should, this should get all of us. If, if you've never done any of these things, ask yourself this, have you thought any of these things? I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's the Christian's daily marching order. Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. That's the description of the Christian life. In other words, are you at war? If you're born again, you're at war with yourself in this world. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not uh, do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's just a statement of fact. If the Spirit of God is at work within you, you don't need 10 commandments pointed on your, uh, posted on your wall or tattooed on your skin. God's embedded on your heart. The law is holy, just, and good. It's awesome. It's perfect. But you can't keep it. The best you'll ever come to keeping it is keeping it in spirit. Even though our flesh will fail, now we see, God, you do it through me. You live your life through me. This is the, oh my goodness, that is the, that's the key. God's law is amazing. I just can't do it. But if I walk in the spirit of God, I'm not under the law. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are these. In other words, this is what the worldly people do who don't know God. Adultery. You, you, you know what adultery is? Adultery is either two people having sex that are not married uh, to one another. Both of them are married. Or it could be one is married and one is single and they're together. That's still adultery. Coupled with or compounding Fornication. Fornication is what I just said a second ago, plus, um, or adding to uh, single. P 
people messing around with each other. Is, is that thrilling? Is that exciting? The Bible says, Moses said, it's thrilling. Why do you think it's a problem? Well, if you knew my husband. That's not the point. Well, if you, my wife, she, no, no, no. no. God says, this is how marriage works and this is how being single works. If you don't want to be single, get married. The Bible actually says that. I, mean, I don't know if you know this or not. But the Bible says, if you burn in your heart with lust, get married. <laughs> See, it can't be that simple. Well, the Bible says marry a believer. Right? There's more to that, but you can call the office on uh, later. So... And now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. By the way, those four are based in sexuality. Idolatry, that applies to anything and everything. Sorcery, weird word, I admit, but it means hallucinogenic drug use, altering your mind. Can't take life, gotta, gotta dope up. I can't cope, give me, a, give me a drink. I can't cope, so much pressure. Christian praise when there's that kind of pressure. It's way better than the bottle getting lower and then you got to go buy another bottle and then you're, you know, with, you know, every ounce, did you know that one ounce of alcohol kills, I think it's five million or five billion dendrites in your brain. You need dendrites. You need them. I don't know how many you have, but if I lose five, I'm in trouble. <laughs> You should just know that. God is saying, I got a better way for you. By the way, and if you do, if you handle life that way, some of you have seen your mom and dad. That's how you grew up. When mom and dad had pressure, they just reached for a bottle. That's how, that's how they dealt with the lack of money for the mortgage or they couldn't get along. They reached for a bottle. And then you, you grow up and you think, well, that's how problems are solved. You reach for the bottle. And then Jesus comes into your life and says, guess what? We don't do that anymore. We go to our knees. We stand up and lift our eyes up to heaven. That's what we do now. No headache, free, and constant. Wow. Hatred. We live in an age of hatred. Contentions. Best picture, the Greek word for me, because I have a cartoon brain, is somebody getting in an argument with an ant. That word means a person just fights with everybody. Hey, what about this? Oh, what do you mean about that? It's like, back off. What do you mean back off? They just, everything's a war. Nice day, isn't it? For who? <laughs> Jealousies connected to covetousness. Outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions. Dissensions, that is dividing heresies, envy, murders, drunken, drunkenness, revelries, that's uh, orgies, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice or live such things that in life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's not that you've done all these things, it's that you've never come to Christ for him to deal with all these things in your life. Because everybody is guilty of these things, either in act or in thought. We're all guilty. What's the difference? There are sinners who have been forgiven because Christ has come into their lives, and there are sinners who are condemned in hell because Christ did not come into their lives. Until you and I die, we're sinners saved by the grace of God. That doesn't mean we go out and sin. That doesn't mean we're making plans right now that we can't do that anymore. There's a, there's a transformation. And then thirdly under this is reality exposes you to the real you. Verse 10 says, and the commandment which was to bring life, so I thought, keep the law and live, I found to bring death. Simple. The law condemned me. I wish every one of my Jewish friends would get this truth that Paul got 2,000 years ago. You, my, my friends, what do you, 
are you doing this? Are you doing this? Yes, yes, yes. And they always want to come back to me. I love them dearly. And they know I love them dearly. They always come back to me. You don't keep the Sabbath. I said, you don't understand the Sabbath. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm Jewish. I said, you understand the Sabbath through Judaism. You're not understanding the Sabbath through the Bible. Old and New Testament. You ought to read it. Why? Because when you come to Christ, the Bible says in the book of Colossians, Christ Jesus becomes our Sabbath. See, the Sabbath was to allow you a blessing to rest and to think about God and to just relax in him and you're not to do any labor. You're to be on vacation for 24 hours. Guess what? The Christian who understands the Bible is on vacation 24-7. You understand the difference? One was a type or a symbol of what was to come. Everything is wrapped up in the reality of Jesus. When he comes into your life, guess what? See, look at Sunday. I'm Sabbathing right now. Say, <laughs> so aren't you working? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm doing this, but here's the deal. I'm doing this, but the inside of me is Sabbathing. What about tomorrow? Sabbathing. <laughs> what about Tuesday? What about next Thursday? Sabbath. <laughs> Every day for the believer is a Sabbath. Amen. Moses made that clear. Paul echoed it. Jesus said it. Now, reality exposes you to the real you. Verse 10. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found it to bring death. That's why you and I have this incredible, God-given desire, thought, wonder about eternal life. Summed up in this. The scriptures say, he has written eternity on our hearts. Every single one of us, I don't care who you are, just don't tell me later, oh, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, I never have that thought. Yes, you do. You probably think about this thought more than we do, and that is, what happens after we're dead? You and I know what happens after we die. We live. In fact, technically, we don't even die. Amen. I'm gonna end that. I'm gonna end my message with that one. But to an atheist, it's like, but uh, there, there can't be anything after death, right? So there's nothing. It's just no, gone. no consciousness, nothing. Yeah, you think? I hope, I hope so. <laughs> what, what if you're wrong? Yeah. <laughs> There's a chance of you being wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure. Have you ever been wrong before? <laughs> I think you're wrong. Jesus said you're wrong. Atheist, that's a tough way to live. It's, a, it's even tougher to die. Third and finally, it's this, verses 11 and 12, and that is death stands waiting at your door. Just when you thought it was over. This is predominantly now to those of you who don't have a pers personal relationship with Jesus. Just when you thought it was over. How many people have swallowed alive Satan? Oh, you know what? I've, I've lived my life, grabbed all the gusto I could get. I, I'm about to die with the most toys. I guess I'll win. Mm, no. When death stands waiting at your door, you have, believe me, you've never been there. You have a change of heart. Have you ever thought you were dying? Remember your thoughts when you thought you were dying? None of the thoughts that you had when you thought you were dying were, I wonder what the, wonder what the, 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 new, the new model of the, you know, is going to be for 23. No, you didn't think that. This is reality, friends. Death stands waiting at your door. And so look at verse 11, death knocks using your sin, my sin, it knocks. <laughs> For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. What does that mean? That means the law says you shall not covet. And then you read the law and you go, oh my goodness, I covet. And then what happens is death comes right in and uses the law of God and points out your sin and death says, you're going down, baby. You're going down to the pit. Death. Remarkable. 
It knocks on your door with your sin. Imagine somebody knocking on your door with your sin. It's just, what's that flopping at the door? What is that sound? And you open it up and there's this, this person just draped in black holding images or a picture or a, something that proves your sin. Death does that. Death chases us. The book of Hebrews says that all throughout human life, men have feared death until Christ. Wow. Death, knocking. That's why the words are used, taking, taking advantage of or taking the occasion of, deceiving. There was no deception by God. We were deceived by ourselves. Wait a minute, I didn't view it this way. You were wrong. God's word is true, always true. And then look in verse 12, it goes on. It's not only that death knocks using your sin, it's that death knows you're not perfect. Death knows you're not perfect. Therefore, by the laws, uh, therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Why it, it points, calls us out. <laughs> and then I want to end this uh, faithfully to the Lord. And so number three, guys, mark it down, is that death nails you to the grave. Think of that picture for a moment. Death nails you to the grave. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Lisa and I went to uh, her, her mom and dad's um, grave site. I think it's in Brea, forget where. Brea or Fullerton, doesn't matter. And uh, we were walking around and we found the location. And it's, it's awesome because uh, her dad, uh, when, when he was dying at USC, um, you know when the physicians tell you, I'm surprised he's still I'm surprised he's still with us. He should have passed by now. Well, we know exactly why. Is because there was one son. Lisa's my wife's the baby of nine kids. There was the, the oldest son had to fly down from Spokane. And he was delayed and delayed. I don't understand this. Okay, this is beyond human reasoning. He should be dead by now. We're all in the room which is great. We're all in the room and we're like, love you, dad. And then he reaches up, takes his air, his mask off and says, can't you guys sing some hymns? Isn't that great? So it's like, oh man, none of us in the room could sing, but we're like, you know, the old rugged cross. And um, finally, his oldest son comes flying in from the airport, crying, Dad. And it was almost like a Joseph moment. He takes off his mask and he says, I want you now to make up with your brother. <laughs> and the older, the oldest son promised, I will. And he died. Let me tell you something. Standing in a hospital room, it was almost like a veil opened up and we were there as spectators. Whoosh! And he was gone. And it was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. We're all believers. And you kind of got, you have, to, you have to act respectful, you know, about it. It's like, he passed. Oh my gosh, boom. <laughs> because you know you're in a hospital, you can't go, whoo! He just passed. Like, what do you do? Leave you a billion dollars? No, he went to heaven. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, says the Bible. Don't let death nail you to the grave. That's what Jesus is for. And I end with this. F.F. F. Bruce, the great scholar, says, we must remember, Christian, that our eternal life does not begin at the moment of our death but rather it begins at the moment of our conversion. In that moment of being born again, we are made alive in Christ in such a way that we will never experience death. Did you know that's a fact? Quickly, you can stand. This is how, how done we are. You can stand. Check this out. 
John 14, we'll start. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Watch this. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, that is in heaven, there you may be also. Verse six. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 18, same chapter. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. John 14, 19. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. Listen to this. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. You want to see Jesus? You got to get born again. You won't see him physically with these eyes. You'll see him differently than what you've ever known sight to be like before. How is it that no matter where we're at, last night we were flying through a storm and it was snowing crazy, absolutely nuts. The plane's bouncing around. People are kind of freaking out. And uh, of course, because of last week's message, I talked about turbulence. So God said, live it. <laughs> and... It's so great. I'm looking at the wing. You know, the, you know, have you ever seen a plane? You know you're flying when the plane's going like this. And I thought, man, if this thing broke up, it happened so fast. Lord, this is the way to go. And I'm actually thinking this way. So if you don't like that, you, don't, you won't want to travel with me. But. And then finally this, John 6:37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, this is your reality. Just when you thought it was over, it's just beginning for us. Listen, if you're not a Christian, just when you thought it was over, oh, it's going to get a lot worse. That's your decision. Listen to the words of Jesus. Respond to him. Come to him. He sets you free from religion. He writes his word in your heart. He changes you from the inside out. Receive him. Father, we praise you and thank you for your truth. Bless these precious ones, Lord, as they go out on, for us, strange highways. They're wet. There could be dangerous, Lord. Keep them safe. Watch over them. Bless them this week. Spoil them this week with your tender, loving care. Lord, single them out as objects of your affection. Go with them as you've promised. I will not leave you. <laughs> I will not forsake you. We thank you, God, for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for the empty tomb. We thank you, Lord, for the grace of God. In Jesus' name and all God's people said... Amen. God bless you.